There are still some seats at the front. Uh, you could take the VIP seats here. Let's start uh, a very good evening, everyone. Uh, I'm Stanley. Welcome to the tonight's Agile Meetup. So this is the first time I'm starting a new series called Agile Journey Series. Uh, the point of this ser series is to uh, invite people in the organization um, who have started their journey of Agile and uh, to invite them to share with us their experience. So I'm uh, very happy to be able to um, to get uh, Winston from SP Digital, and I also like to um, thank SP Digital for sponsoring their venue and also Pizzas for us. Um, so, without further ado, I think I'm going to kick start this. This session is going to be uh, pretty casual. Um, we are going to um, imagine there is a fire, fire, fire site. No fire camp, campfire, whatever, over here. And I'll talk talk over 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 that campfire. So uh, maybe for uh, to get some starts, um, maybe Winston, can you tell us uh, more about yourself and what you do in SP? Okay, hello everyone. Uh, my name is Winston. So yeah, like what Stanley said, I think uh, let's keep it you know casual. If at any time you know you have questions, feel free to to ask. Uh, if not, it could be until we, we, are, we are done to the Q&A section. I also have a lot of colleagues with me today. So in any case, if I start to bullshit, you know, please call me out for that. <laughs> because I do hope that you know, this session uh, you know, uh, will be very open, transparent, very truthful on uh, our Agile journey so far. All right. So to answer uh, Stanley's question, who am I, etc. Et uh, so uh, my name is Winston. Um, I joined uh, SP Digital almost, you know, uh, when it just started. So it's like two months after SP Digital started. So Michael and I joined together um, to sort of like help put in Agile practices, you know, for, for this place. Um, of course, it evolved. Uh, along the way and right now if you ask me what am I doing now and specifically leading a team called engineering excellence uh, and engineering excellence covers three important pillars right the first pillar would be on culture developer practices so agility falls into this pillar uh, quite nicely and then I have another pillar called engineering effectiveness where we look at you know, building internal tools or getting external tools in to help make our developers 10 times more effective in how they are working. And the last pillar is technical excellence, where we also have a team of quality engineers who are doing a lot of test automation, a little bit of manual testing and stuff like that to keep the quality of products that we roll out, you know, to, to clients at a tip-top shape. So that's, you know, basically what it has evolved till to this stage so far. Cool. Uh, could you also share with us about your background, like before XP, where, where were you and what do you do? Okay, so I mean, without going all the way in time, <laughs> I think I just mentioned the important parts of how my Agile journey began. So I would attribute that to my days at uh, Pivotal Labs. Uh, how many of you have heard of Pivotal as a company? All right, a lot of you have heard of Pivotal, right? So before they were called Pivotal, yeah, they were called Pivotal Labs. Um, and it was just a consultancy uh, specializing in Ruby on Rails. So that was like, how many years? Nine years ago already, when they decided to come to Singapore to set up shop uh, in, in Singapore. Um, and they sort of uh, asked if I wanted to join them uh, as a developer, right, as a local hire, uh, because they'd be setting up shop uh, in Singapore. At that time, actually, it was very funny because I was already like, transiting out from being a developer, I was going to become a product manager, right? That was like the, you know, aspiration for all software engineers in Singapore at that time. <laughs> so, so, you know, it was, it was like, hey, do you want to come back to be a software engineer again? Um, and at that time, I was really skeptical. Uh, hey, do I really want to do that or I just go and be my product manager? 
But I started to read up about what Pivotal Labs um, does, you know, in terms of engineering. I found it very interesting because they were doing uh, pair programming. Um, and it's not just, you know, occasionally. They do pair programming every single day uh, from 9 a.m. to 6 p.m., right? Every single day. Uh, and then they do test-driven development, uh, so on and so forth. So basically all of the XP practices uh, that you, you read, they do it every single day. So at that time, I was like, oh, you know, are you sure? I'm going to sit beside someone uh, staring at the same you know, monitor for eight hours, nine hours a day. You know? why, why go mad because of that? And then what if I don't like my pair, right? So I was very skeptical. But I went in for the interviews, etc. And I found that, oh, actually, it's not that scary and it seems quite interesting. Um, so it felt like um, it was an opportunity, you know, I get to... I get to uh, uh, enjoy or get to learn without having to go to San Francisco. So I decided, okay, oh, let's give it a try. If not, then I'll go back to being a product manager. <laughs> so, so I went uh, and luckily I passed the interviews uh, and that sort of began my agile journey, right? So for three years, I was with uh, Pivotal Lab Singapore. And of course, you know, to them, uh, it, they are not explicitly calling it Agile anymore, etc. It just became their way of life, right? In, in Pivotal Labs, you know, doing pair programming, doing test-driven development, uh, so on and so forth. So that was the, you know, the uh, culture I was immersed in. Uh, after three years, I sort of um, decided to leave uh, and start my own um, consulting agency, which I call uh, Jolly Good Code. Um, why did I do that? Uh, because I find that uh, it was interesting, you know, I got to learn a lot from Pivotal Labs. But yeah, at the same time, I wanted to um, have uh, access or have control or be able to reach out to more fellow startups in Singapore and try to help them you know, on this journey in understanding what Agile was about um, and how they can you know, do better with, uh, I would feel, you know, software engineering management in general. Right? Because like I said, uh, before that, a lot of engineers are just thinking of becoming a product person or project person right, uh, after a while because Software engineering management, I feel, is still a very uh, nascent uh, kind of uh, uh, discipline over here in, in, in Singapore. And a lot of engineers are leaving right, because they don't get that. And when I saw I wanted to do more with startups and to, so that to make sure that uh, people feel like they are valued as a software engineer. So I went out to do my own. So as, well, as Jolly Good Code, I, I would always say uh, it's like an extension of Pivotal Labs. You know, I do roughly the same thing. I do consultancy. I help build startups. Uh, I write code. Uh, I also do some pure agile training. Uh, I also do some uh, pure Ruby on Rails training at that time. So, so these are the things I did for the three years uh, before I actually joined SP Digital. I'm curious, uh, why do you call it Jolly Good Code? Oh, why do I call it Jolly Good Code? Uh, because I feel that, I hope that, uh, you know, I would, I would be happy, you know, doing good work and writing code at the same time. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I decided to call it Jolly Good Code. Can you achieve that? Uh, I do feel I've, I achieved that uh, within those three years uh, that I was running uh, Jolly Good Code. Um, and... So that's why, uh, so it was a consulting as a, as a business nature. And um, after a while, I felt that consulting uh, is, uh, has its pros and cons. Um, one of the cons is that uh, if you scale it very big, then you get into a lot of consultancy challenges where sometimes you have to take in work just to be able to feed the people. Um, and that might compromise you know, the quality of work that you're doing or the... Uh, uh, your principles in terms of what kind of projects you take on or not take on. So those are the challenges. And then when SP came along, uh, I found that, oh, this is probably another stage you know, for me to do agility, for me to do software engineering management at a bigger scale uh, to see how I could further you know, expand uh, the horizon of um, you know, uh, building a software engineering unit uh, that would potentially be well known through its strong practices and strong culture, right? So, so that's why I decided to uh, join SP Digital and take a pause on Jolly Good Code. Could you share with us uh, who are the few people that uh, or mentors that influence who you are today? Um, so I would again largely attribute a lot of that back to uh, uh, 
my pivotal labs days when um, I interacted with a lot of um, my peers who who came from San Francisco, and I felt that uh, they brought along the culture that uh, I that was missing here, and that you know I wasn't a part of. Uh, a lot of it in, includes uh, you know open communication, uh, includes collaboration, includes um, uh, empathy, etc. Right. Um, for example, on the first day, right, when I was, I still remember on the first day in my, in my work when I was doing pair programming with my pair uh, and he had to send out an email uh, to a client to explain on certain things, right? So he, he typed whatever the message was, I can't remember, and then he signed off. He signed off not as himself, he signed off as him and me. I'm like, I didn't even do anything here, <laughs> right? But that, that left a lasting impression to me because it's like, oh, wow, he really treated me as a pair and that we are really doing the work together, right? So even though he's just replying to the email himself, he, he put in my name as well. Maybe he wanted the responsibility for me to know I'm kidding. <laughs> no, but, but that, felt, uh, that felt good, right? Because it felt like, wow, you really, you really uh, empathize with me as a person and you want me to be involved. Of course, it's just one of the examples. And then a lot more examples are then my, you know, my boss back in Pivotal Labs, um, uh, who I, I learned a lot uh, in terms of how to be a nice person <laughs> in general. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. What, what does di nice mean? Uh, I don't know. It's, it's really true, you know, daily interaction of how he empathized with, with us, uh, how he empathized with clients. So it's very non-judgmental. Uh, and it's always operating on uh, let's understand you know the, the the data first before we come to a conclusion, and let's always try to work this through together as a team. Uh, so you know, getting the teams to do retrospectives, you know, very often. Uh, so back in Pivotal Labs, we had breakfast, right? So we even do retrospectives for breakfast, right? To retrospect on how good the breakfast is <laughs> and stuff like that. So uh, a lot of these things, I, I think that sort of, you know, form a lot of my philosophies and a lot of my opinions uh, that I carry on even to today. Yeah. Nice. So um, in your own words, what is Agile? So when I was, uh, so remember I said when I was writing Jolly Good Code, I would sometimes go and, you know, do like a two-hour session to talk about what Agile is. Uh, so I would talk, 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 talk. At the end of the day, you know, at the end of all my slides, I would have one slide. I would just say, okay, if you all forget whatever I say, you can just remember that to me, Agile is about constant feedback, right? Because I feel that um, it is about a lot of practices that we do is about the feedback. We can go as low as you know, the developer practices, uh, test-driven development. It's feedback between you and the code. Right? You write a test, uh, the test fails, and then you write a code to make it pass. It's feedback. And then if you talk about uh, daily stand-ups, it's feedback. It's feedback within the team, right? between individuals. Then you go up one level, you talk about your sprint planning meetings, iteration planning meetings. Then again, it's feedback, collecting feedback. Then if you talk about on a larger scale, now we put in a lot of like, uh, hypothesis testing, you know, validation, you know, we want to be fast in terms of proving our ideas, etc. That's also feedback. So, uh, I mean, to me, that sort of captures the essence of what uh, Agile is really about. Uh, but with my time here in, in uh, SP Digital, right, uh, I've also formed a new thought. Um, so, yeah, the, the video is <laughs> filming, but um, so what I told my guys is that now I feel that Agile to me is just fucking talk, right? Because I find that a lot of people are just don't talk. And that actually creates a lot of the miscommunication or miscollaboration. Uh, and, you know, people think that, you know, putting in more tools, more processes would actually help. But I think it only helps to a certain extent. It's just, it, it only solves the symptoms. It doesn't solve the root cause, which is that we should just talk. Right, so so uh, <laughs> like this one, uh, uh, individuals and interactions exactly, over processes and tools. Exactly, exactly, right. Um, yeah. So the funny thing is, uh, yeah, we we were in a workshop and then the the facilitator asked us what's the twelve principles of agile, right? Nobody can remember it, <laughs> but I just read it up. I just read, I just read the the second one, you know, which is like we should always favor change. Right or something like that. But interestingly, you know, developers always tell us, ah, no, we don't like 
change at the last minute or things like that. But actually, that's one of the principles in Agile. You should favor the change even if it comes at the last minute. Right? Because your process, or rather the, the workflow that we do, should actually uh, allow us to react to that uh, very easily and very quickly. Hmm. Yeah, agree. That, that, that challenge comes uh, is also people are naturally, or most people, or not some people, uh, changes are something could be unfamiliar. Hmm. Uh, you know, the familiarity zone, comfort zone, and the unfamiliar zone. So how people deal with the unfamiliarity could affect how they respond to it when something unfamiliar comes. Mm. Yeah. Okay, um, I'd like to, we are going to shift more into SP Digital. Uh, in your time over here, right at the beginning, uh, share with us your journey, challenges, and also what you tried, uh, what, what doesn't work. Yeah. So, so when it started, it was really Michael and I. Right. So Michael also came from Pivotal Labs, but we were of a different era. <laughs> but, but whatever I, I know, he knows as well. Right? So, so when we started, we sort of have that pure intuition of, you know, we want to make software engineering you know, awesome here. Um, uh, of course, we have to, I mean, in, in essence, it's agile, right? We have to call it agile. Uh, but if you ask us, right, you know, what flavor of agile do we do here? Then I think neither of us can answer it. Because to us, it will just be agile. And then people will give us a weird stare, you know. What, what do you mean? Do you mean Scrum? Do you mean Kanban? Then like, no, we, are, we do agile, right? Because to us, that's our philosophy. That's our, that's our belief that, you know, agile is just agile. Uh, yes, yeah, sure, you can use Scrum, you can use Kanban, you can use XP. Actually, we use a mix of them here. So it's also very hard for me to say we use one thing. Um, so I'm not a purist in terms of, of that. So when we started, right, uh, we, what we really try to do is do a lot more pair programming with the teams. We get, we get embedded in the teams, you know, we try to work with them, uh, we try to, you know, help them do planning, uh, try to in, in, introduce the technical processes, uh, everything. Um, but over time, you know, the, the team suddenly exploded. They started hiring more, uh, as in uh, hiring growth, right? Um, and it, because there were only the two of us, it became a bit, <laughs> unscalable, right? So I think that's our, our, our biggest challenge. You know, how do we scale that process to a lot more people? And even to today, I think we're trying to figure that out. So what we started to doing, do after that is to uh, write more documentation. In fact, then I, I got in uh, Sylvia to help me. So Sylvia is right, the agile specialist in our team right now. So she's so, so purely focusing on agile uh, uh, specifically. Unlike us, you know, like we were sort of like, we don't call ourselves agile specialists. I think we call us, we identify ourselves as software engineers, but you know, we had that knowledge. Even if you ask me now, I'm not Scrum certified, I'm not whatever certified, so you might say I'm an imposter. Right? <laughs> so, uh, yeah. um, so we, we got in uh, Sylvia to sort of focus on, on agile specifically because we find that over time as the team grows, then uh, inevitably we need to put in the guidelines, the processes to help bridge the communication uh, between people. Um, and to make sure that uh, people still talk uh, with each other and uh, with different teams, etc., to, to move the project along. So, um, we, 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 I, I would say we have, um, we try to put in things that we are familiar with and things that uh, we believe should be there in an agile organization. So, starting with technical processes, right? I mean, we try to encourage people to do test driven development. Uh, of course, if you ask me, is everyone doing it now? No, the answer is no, right? I, I'm not going to lie to you. Um, it's very hard for us to make sure everyone can do that, you know, very nicely. Uh, even now, the challenge is, do people even write tests? Right? I think that's also one of the evolving challenges. Because new people come in, they bring a lot of uh, different knowledge, they bring a lot of baggage. The baggage can exist in the form of, they had a lot of agile training, but maybe specific to Scrum, let's say. So they think that Agile is Scrum, right? It could exist in the form of they had no training at all, right? So then they don't know what to expect. Or it could exist in the form that they had the wrong training. So they come here and kept talking about the wrong training as well. So, you know, there, there's a lot of uh, things that we need to sort of unbundle and, and fix and educate uh, along the way. Even till today, I would say we are still uh, trying to tackle all of these problems, getting everyone aligned. Uh, Etc. Uh, and that would be our main challenge. So, like I said, we put in the technical practices. We then also put in all the all of the stand ups, you know, the planning meetings, uh, so on and so forth. But we try and let the teams uh, 
iterate and figure out whether this makes sense for them and, and tweak it along the way. I think one of the challenges is also that uh, when Michael and I started, our belief is that we don't need a scrum master. Right? Because back when we were with Pivotal Labs, we worked as a software engineer and then it's like a self-managing -manag team. You know, everyone contributes. The life is good, right? <laughs> uh, but when we, when we come here, then I think um, uh, we... I think that that was one of the things that we experimented and it didn't work very well, right? It turns out that mm, somehow in a large organization like this, you know, with many teams running, maybe we do need someone dedicated to Agile uh, and to be specific to that. Right now, I mean, we are still toying with the idea. Do we really need a Scrum Master per team? Do we really need to train you know, one per team? I think we are still trying to evaluate and see if that is the right answer or not, you know, to running Agile teams. But of course, my hope is that all the teams will be just self-managing, right? You don't need one specific role for that. Uh, and I'm sure a lot of agile coaches here, some of agile coaches, right, will also feel that even as an agile coach, your role will be to come in, help educate the team, you know, pack the team nicely. Hopefully, they can self-manage, then you would uh, exit to, to go to other teams, right? So, so that's our belief. But, so we are still trying to toy with the idea and see whether it will work or not. When, when you talk about the, the growth uh, hiring, um, Oh, what 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 is what are the numbers like? Uh, so I mean, uh, three years ago, I mean, it started with one South Shong, right? Then today we have around hundred and fifty people. I think maybe eighty percent are engineers, if I can remember the numbers right correctly. And still growing. Yeah, it's still growing. I mean, it's still growing. Mm -mm 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 -mm. Um, what 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 contributes to the? Is it a need for growth, or what? What what influences the the growth part? I I mean definitely there's jobs coming in, so there's a requirement for growth. I mean if you talk about SB Digital, maybe I explain what SB Digital does, right? So SB Digital is like uh, a, a a team that was formed three years ago for SP Group. Uh, so SP Group uh, is the one that sends you the utilities bill, you know, every month. But that's not the main line of business. The main line of business in the, is in the transmission and distribution of electricity, right? We own the grid. So SP Digital was formed to do like digitalization for SP Group uh, and also to identify uh, new products in the energy space that we could, you know, potentially build. So uh, we have like two uh, main uh, uh, interests. One is in consumer and one is in commercial and industrial. So if you talk about consumer, uh, is the is the mobile app that you might be using uh, on your phone right now that allows you to check your bills, pay your bills, and also any other things that might potentially be more consumer-facing in nature. When we talk about CNI, uh, it's more of the B2B uh, businesses. So things that I can publicly talk about are things like, you know, we put solar panels in community centers, in SEMCorp, and then uh, we build software solutions to help uh, look at the load profile, to look at, you know, how we are drawing electricity from the solar, from the grid, and how we can optimize their load so on and so forth, together with AI and stuff like that. Um, and so like uh, a mix between commercial and consumer is that recently we also put in uh, electric charging vehicle, electric vehicle charging capabilities in the app itself. So you can now use the app to charge your electric vehicles if you see uh, charging stations around the island that is owned by SP, right? So uh, these are the things that uh, we are building. Mm. Um, could you... Uh, share a bit about uh, what kind of uh, roles or uh, skills are there in the team to to serve uh, to, to to work on the product. Uh, so it really depends from the consumer piece. Uh, usually, is more of the regular uh, software engineers, you know, with uh, front end capability, back end capability. Of course, because there's a mobile app, then we 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 build our apps natively. So there'll be folks who are focusing on iOS focusing on uh, Android. Uh, for the CNI space, then uh, uh, we also have this without the mobile developers, uh, but we also have sort of like what we call IoT engineers uh, because when we talk about um, the solar panels, you know, or hardware, uh, we actually build small boxes for us to collect data and bring it back to... to uh, to us, uh, and these data are like on the IoT boxes that we built. So we have IoT engineers who are actually handling that. Uh, but otherwise, yeah, it's it's same mix of uh, software engineers in general. Okay. Uh, what 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 is uh, how how big is the team size here? Is there any? Uh, 
guidelines. So it's a um, it's a mixed. Um, there are some that's like two people, you know. Some that's like seven or eight or even more. Uh, and we are sort of going through a, a reevaluation of how are we structuring, you know, the teams right now. Um, uh, and increasingly, you know, uh, so we have two different parts, right? So one part might be more functional in nature, right? Splitting people in terms of uh, their abilities, and then another part. Could be experimenting with being more a uh, feature squad uh, type right now with you know full set of capabilities within uh, the teams. So um, as you can see here, I mean uh, we try a lot of different things uh, to see what might work, what might not work. I think it also depends a lot on context uh, and a lot on the people skills, uh, etc., and and how we how we shape that. Mm. I think we have been talking about almost half an hour, and I, I thought to open open up the questions from the floor. Uh, if you have any questions for for Winston, uh, now is the time. Any questions? Do you, do you work with uh, do you work with SP Group IT, and are they agile? Uh, we do work with them. Ah, uh, good question. Because, for example, uh, when we talk about security, if we talk about hardware. Um, on-prem hardware, actually they will be helping us with that and security and stuff like that, they will be helping us with that uh, because we do not have all of the functions here uh, and no, they are not, they would not you know, identify themselves as agile, right? So uh, the challenges also comes in the form of how do we sometimes uh, work with the mothership. Uh, I think uh, it's a mixed bag you know, of feelings. I think sometimes you just have to default back to uh, the processes that work for them uh, because otherwise it's very hard for them to collaborate as well. Mm -hmm. That would be my answer. Um, you shared a lot, uh, like there's a strong focus on uh, software engineering and practices. Mm. Can you share a little bit about the like, product product, and uh, maybe the, the user experience parts? Like what uh, would be the okay. mixes? My head of UX is actually here. Chris. <laughs> so, uh, share a little bit about that. What would you like to know more? Like, oh, okay, okay, okay. So, okay. So, ah, good, good, good. Okay. So, I mean, more context of that is that um, in the past, uh, product engineers will actually sit within uh, SP Digital formally, right? So, they were part of, you know, the HQ and stuff like that and we were working with them in that kind of relationship. Recently, we sort of like brought them in to the mix so that uh, it's all under one uh, organization. Um, and so that's, so in the past, it did feel, felt a little bit like a uh, vendor client relationship to a certain extent. So it could be very agile here, but a little bit more of a, you know, deliverables and gated process there. Uh, but I think increasingly we are trying to bridge everyone together to make sure that uh, we are all concerted, you know, and aligned on what we're we trying to do, you know, how we're we approaching this uh, product angle and, and things like that. Uh, UX has been with us since day one, right? So uh, a lot of, I mean, we all we, we do UX research, right? Uh, for them, they do a lot of hypothesis testing. They do a lot of you know user validation to make sure that whatever we are building uh, is what users want uh, and then they keep on improving the UX uh, in that manner as well. So UX and developers are very tightly uh, integrated. Um, but okay, so for example, like my team, right, and UX, uh, so my team is engineering excellence. We, we act like the support teams, a shared services team, right? We are not specific to one product. Uh, so we have a lot of product teams that are specific to that. But UX team and our team and a few other teams would be more of like Okay, you have requirements. Now we'll come in and help you. We'll come in and help you. We'll come in and help you. because, uh, yeah, we, we so certain things we are not like fully cross-functional where we have one dedicated person in that team. We do try to say, okay, this product has a lot of requirements now. Then we will dedicate that person for this period of time. But it's not like, you know, we won't shift the person around for shared services in that sense. More for economies of scale. Lah. Okay, so from a product management perspective, how is it managed? Like, is there like a central group to define 
what's going to be built or each team has the ability to define what they're going to build next how does it work how uh, it, because the domain is quite different uh from you know regular domains that maybe a regular person like us would, would know about a lot of times uh product requirements do come from like a centralized group of product people who have done a lot more in-depth research or domain knowledge within that area of focus right um but of course then they would come back to the developers and you know we would see what is feasible what is not feasible and whether it can be done or not so there will still be that kind of uh collaboration uh that we would see you know between the product and the developers of course i think as as what I've mentioned, right? Uh, all of this communication and collaboration can definitely all be improved even further. There's definitely still going to be some gaps in terms of how communication, how the how the how the uh, information reaches us. You know, is it too early, too late, and, and things like that. I'm not going to sugarcoat it, right? So uh, it does still happen. So, but it's more about making sure then we are explicit in telling the product people, hey, you know, we we definitely need to work this out. Can we do it in a different way? Okay. One more question. So, being a consultant yourself, have you ever thought about engaging consultants, or is it everyone internal? Uh, so, uh, lately, I've been toying with that idea, but more with the sense of from a training perspective. Because, for example, I said like, um, as the team scales, right, uh, we start to notice that everyone comes in with a different set of baseline in terms of what agility is about. Uh, so if you ask, you know, different people will have different opinions. Um, some could be right, some could be wrong. Some could be extremists, some could be non-extremists, right? So I feel that uh, I, 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 that's what I'm thinking about in terms of, you know, tailoring a customized training program that could be more contextual to what we feel is, you know, our type of agile and to at least spread that across the whole team uh, and maybe specific to the roles that people are playing. So maybe product owners could have something a little bit more specific to them. Uh, developers will have something more specific to them. If they want to play that scrum master role, you know, they can have something that's more specific to them. Mm. But I mean, uh, yeah, my, my challenge is that if we look at training in general, um, across the board in Singapore, there's a lot of scrum training. Right, but like I said, then if you ask me what's my type of agile, it's not scrum, it's not Kanban, it's not XP, it's just agile. So that is a challenge for me in terms of finding the right training. Yeah, because sometimes I mean not to not to bash scrum, right? <laughs> when when you know, if people go for scrum training, they come back, and then they'll be like, oh, we need to do this, 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 this. You know, very dogmatic. Yeah, then uh, like to me, it's always. Actually, I want you to go and understand the principles of what Agile is about. Uh, even though you cannot you know, memorize the 12 principles, it's okay. But understand you know, the, the, core, the core behind it on what, what actually is Agile. Yeah. Uh, I wonder after hearing this from Winston, someone is going to create an Agile training. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Okay, we have, uh, I think we have, um, raise your hand. One, two, three. Okay, let's start with yeah, so I have a lot of colleagues here. If I bullshit, please call me out on it. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> uh, hi. Uh, based on your uh, uh, expertise at uh, SP here, on SP Agile uh, journey, and also at your own venture uh, as a coaching uh, guide for new new companies, do you have any list of common Agile traps which companies may fall for while implementing Agile? Like common mistakes that they may end up making? Uh, during agile implementations, can there be something called as too much communication? Uh, yeah. Um, I've never seen too much communication yet, right? You, so usually there's too little. Uh, I would say a lot of times. I would say one trap is that, like I said, you know, people would want to say, uh, okay, let's let's have this process here, you know, let's put in this tool here, right? They will think that, okay, so firstly, maybe they will think that the tool can solve all of the problems, right? But sometimes it only solve the symptoms. Uh, and they will think that, oh, we need to put in certain processes in place. But if you really start to map it out, you put in a lot of process, right? Then everything just becomes very gated. Then it just actually looks like waterfall instead of being agile. Uh, which is why, for a while, we were almost going to fall into that trap. You know, I was talking to Sylvia, we were like, okay, let's map this out. You know, okay, maybe we should have, you know, this 
gate here to check on certain things just before it moves there because developers are complaining about this and that, right? But you know, as we met, we met it up, then we're like, this feels like waterfall. And then why are we not doing waterfall, <laughs> right? Then we're like, no, 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 this should be... <laughs> then we started to cancel, right? No, 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 this, this is not right, this is not right. It, people should just talk. It's, it's, and so maybe we should be thinking about processes that will help people talk, right? So I think then one of the challenges is that then people will start thinking that there's a lot of meetings to talk, right? Uh, so the challenge is to identify then who are the relevant people that should be part of the meeting, you know, how can we make the meeting more effective? How can we make the meeting more productive so that people will find that there's always value in, in going to these meetings. Unfortunately, I think as the number of people increase in the team, right, communication has to increase as well. You cannot say you minimize it because if you minimize it, then there's going to be more miscommunication. Some people would feel like they are being left out of the decision-making process as well. And that's not what Agile is about, I feel. So I think, yeah, it's a, it's a, a, a that is double edged sword. So maybe maybe the correct answer is to then find the right level of team size so that you know that can stay in. Yeah, correct, correct, correct. Uh since you mentioned about now you have a hundred and fifty plus, you know, people here and I guess probably you have more than ten, twenty, you know, agile uh, teams, independent teams. So how do you manage the collaborations and, you know, uh, knowledge sharings, you know, license sharings across the Agile teams? And probably you can share more about, you know, how, how you build the culture here at SP Digital. Ah, okay. So every Thursday we have Tech Talks over here. So like if you look at the board over there, the door, you know, it's our like Tech Talk schedules. I mean, we are missing two weeks because this week there's a lot of people who is out for Go Fundamentals training and then next week is like holiday. It's one day after holiday. But if not, we will always have Tech Talk scheduled on Thursday. Uh, and it started, you know, like very early since we joined uh, and uh, mainly so that we wanted to make sure there's a forum for people to learn. It could be technical things that's related to work or actually it could be non-technical things. I think one of the first few talks was about how to solve rubric, uh, the, 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 the Rubik Cube. Right, uh, but there are also talks that's very relevant to the domain that we're in now nowadays. You know, some people give a talk on energy industry and, and things like that. That's one. Uh, and then we also have a uh, cross sharing between teams that is uh, domain specific, uh, technical specific. So y y this is like a little bit like the Spotify model. Um, so for example, we have a lot of developers who might be doing Go in different projects. So we would every two weeks or, or at a certain point in time, we will bring everyone together to share about, you know, their experience in using Go on the projects, what do they want to talk about and things like that. So with regards to different programming languages, we will have the different sharing tracks. Um, those are two of sort of the, uh, you know, specific uh, learning activities that we put in to make sure that people cross learn from each other. Mm. General culture, yes. Yeah, actually it's not easy. It's very difficult. I would say I don't have a good answer. Even I'm trying to figure that right now. Uh, I mean, our hiring process, okay. I mean, through our hiring process, that hiring process is definitely one of the first gates that we have, right? So that we will definitely screen for culture fit. Uh, so we so our hiring process is uh we will first send a take home test you know we check on technical ability then we will bring the person in you know we have a chat we also do two rounds of pair programming with uh, our developers to make sure that you know everyone is comfortable uh, although we don't do pro pair programming here you know on the uh, daily basis but so for us pair programming here is like we use it as a tool um, for us uh, when we require for example knowledge sharing. Uh, there's a very difficult problem that we need to work on, etc. Um, so we actually have pairing stations set up uh, at, at the end of the room. So we have a few pairing stations set up. So if you want to pair, then you can go over there to, to do pairing. Right? So we, we make sure that there's conducive environment for them to do these kind of activities. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, my question is about how you you're manage the potential chaos. Because you mentioned about you're your, your allowed to have a uh, uh, change of a request at the last minute. 
So if that happens too frequently, then would it affect a team to achieve the goal of a sprint? And secondly, you you mentioned about uh, your basically share resource across different teams. So if it happened too frequently, say, would it have a case that people are fighting over resources because they have their own, own uh, goal, different goals to achieve? So let me answer the second question first. So product teams will definitely have their own uh, dedicated developers who are working on the product itself. Um, the shared services, I've been, is more of like, uh, we know we would have this challenge. So we are sort of built to try and handle that or to give relevant expectation to the teams that, okay, we are focusing on one now, I cannot focus on another. So for example, to give example of uh, Sylvia, right? she's our agile specialist, but she can only work with one or two teams at one single point in time. She can't work with all of the teams that we have here. So, you know, it's that communication. So of course, other teams will be screaming out, you know, oh, we don't need that, we don't need that. And then we'll be like, yeah, okay, okay. I mean, so the picture is we're hiring, right, for agile specialists. <laughs> but the second thing is that uh, then we will communicate, you know, that, yeah, we don't have the right person to do this now. Uh, actually, we want people to be self-managing. Would someone want to step up you know, and do some of these roles that you believe was supposed to be a role of the agile specialist, right? So we ask people to try and step up in, in, in certain things. Um, so for the first, what was the first question again? Uh, how to manage the chaos? Frequent change requests. Yeah, actually, that one have to. I think developers uh, have to ask the developers actually, right? Because I'm not on the day-to-day -day coding. I mean, what we do is, uh, I think we do try and make sure that changes in the last minute would be, you know, reasonable. If if they are like really drastic changes, then maybe it it, it should be a new story instead. Right, uh, but of course you are right. You know, actually, uh, when we do team retrospective, uh, such things do come up. And then when we dig into it, then maybe it's like, oh, it's because the user requirement wasn't clear enough in the first place, uh, and that is why it resulted in all of these changes. So you know, for us, then what we try and do is to fix that root cause, which is then to check with PO. Hey, can we do a much more deeper dive into the story before even we start? All right, so we start to do like pre-IPMs to dive into the story to see how we can understand the story even better from a UX perspective, from a developer perspective, you know, from a product perspective before the, pro the before the developer actually start. So then we spend invest time in the pre-building activities instead, yeah, to minimize that. I'm not sure if that helped. Yeah, maybe Kenneth will be able to answer that. <laughs> yeah, does pre-IPM help in reducing? Chaos. Hello? Yeah, so probably the correct word to use is refinement backlog. So before we come to sprint planning, the PO tells us, hey, we want to work on this story. So um, it, it sometimes our our we call it pre pre IPMs, um, where we our product planning period is actually can be longer than one day. Sometimes we have multiple features running. Um, so how, for example, my team, what we do is that for a sub feature, I would try to get um, an owner for the topic. It could be an engineer who will actually ask the people, "What do you want to do?" And before that. Before the meeting, because we don't want to come to the meeting and then, oh, let's waste one hour think, brainstorming about ideas or trying to solve the problem. We, what we try to do, we try to um, ask somebody to propose a, a solution. And then when we come to, a meet, come to the meeting, um, we will just tweak the solution based off um, what was proposed so that meetings become more effective. And so when our meetings are now more structured, uh, we don't waste so much time and in fact um, what I'll, what we is currently done is that uh, for we, we have two two hour sessions two sorry two days of two hour sessions and then I'll tell people these are at the pre IPM um, these are the items that you're going to talk about if you are interested you come in and sit in and we found out that a lot of people are enthusiastic about it 
And at this point of time, we have a lot of engineers trying to own the topic and trying to drive the stories. Yeah. So and so this whole thing, right? I would say credits to Kenneth, you know, for stepping up into doing this, you know, for for the team. Uh, because if you ask him, he will identify himself as a software engineer as well, right? Not as a agile person. Uh, and that's what I'm very consoled in seeing, you know, people stepping up to take on this responsibility. And that's really what I believe, you know, we built the culture, we built the support environment to allow this to happen, hopefully, with more people. Yes. Uh, sorry, we have one qu question for you first. And then, then uh, Samantha, then you. All right. So you say that uh, you follow uh, the different practices in Agile, but you just do not want to say to one word that you do not you are following or you are following XP or something like that. But you just want to say that you follow Agile. Simple. It means that you do you, you just do not want to restrict any practice to be followed in any particular application, develop it or something like that. So in your journey you might have tweaked it a little bit less or more according to the requirement or the team size, etc. So what is the outcome till now? What kind of practices do you think which which work best for you, which you had to pick up to some up to some extent or something like that? Or the pure agile scrum or XP practices which work best for you? Okay, good question. So I would say definitely over time I think we picked up a lot more scrum. Uh, right. Uh, because I think, I don't know. Uh, I feel the the answer maybe is because it's much more universally understood, you know, uh, and it's quite specific in nature on what it means, what it does. So it might be easier to communicate that, you know, as a start. So maybe if you ask me to think back on all of these, maybe what should have been what. And this is what I, the feedback I got a lot from developers as well, right? Uh, because we say it's agile, uh, it, it doesn't give people a right framing. Uh, there's nothing to catch on. So sometimes people feel a bit lost. So maybe we should have done this in the first place and also just say we do scrum. So it's like training wheels, right? So you're on the training wheel, you just do root practice, root practice, root practice, only until one day when you really don't need it anymore, then you can remove that. You know, maybe that's another uh, methodology we should have adopted. Because then over time, yeah, we do find that we, div we, we take more scrum because that's more easily explained. But at the same time, then some people are trying more Kanban style as well, right? Like the TV here, you'll see that they, they plan their stuff in Kanban. Yeah. So again, then we, I, I, that's why I don't want to restrict uh, sometimes when you say specific things like, oh, we do scrum that, what if the team really want to try Kanban? Then, you know, would they feel like, oh, okay, I cannot do that? You know, or, or things like that. So in which scenario do you think the Kanban can be more effective? So in which scenario uh, you did uh, assume or you just tell that the Kanban can be more effective than... No, uh, the team sort of wants to try that, you know, and because they are familiar with that uh, Kanban, right? Okay. So then they decided to try it themselves. I try not to dictate and say we should do it something, something, something. Okay. My, uh, the audit world will want me to dictate <laughs> so that it's all documented and people don't follow the documentation, you know, then uh, something wrong. But to me, that's not agile, right? Agile is allowing people to figure out what works best for the team with the relevant knowledge, with the relevant skills, with the relevant context. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay, we have time for the last two questions, Samantha and the uh, gentleman behind. Yeah. Hi. Yes. Are you able to share what kind of metrics or outcomes you look at in achieving engineering excellence? So, uh, when we talk about engineering excellence, um, there I think there are a lot of facets to it right which is why i said the engineering excellence as a team we have three main pillars that we look at we look at culture the level of practices we look at engineering effectiveness we look at technical excellence so there are metrics that uh we would probably be looking at you know within each um i would say we are not uh absolutely you know the best at looking at this uh but when 
we did try to build dashboards, you know, to visualize how teams are doing, right? So one part of, um, you know, new idea that we want to try with regards to Agile is to use data as well to guide us in our planning, you know, guide us in how we are working, which is why, you know, I started to toy with the idea of taking, okay, so we use Pivotal Tracker, right? So start taking numbers out from Pivotal Tracker and trying to visualize them in a way uh, that will help us see whether uh, teams are doing well or not. So for example, uh, I, I, I started to formulate a very naive algorithm, you know, around whether the team is on track or in, you know, danger. Right, so I take numbers like um, how many stories is each developer working on at this point in time. If you are, if one developer holds on to eight stories, you know, then that's a danger sign to me. Um, and then I also look at how many stories have been rejected uh, at this point in time. Uh, I look at you know how many stories are open and stuff like that. So I start to formulate, and then I have a naive algorithm that you know is a hundred hundred. Uh, point score that start to deduct, you know, points of whatever is is showing, and then it will show up as green, amber, or, or red. So that's one thing I've tried. Um, and to me, at least, I feel it's quite accurate. Sometimes when I see that, I know, you know, the team uh, needs some prompting in terms of maybe story acceptance uh, or, or, or things like that. If we dig deeper, then there's also numbers that we might look at from a developer perspective. So we actually start to look into uh, GitHub. Um, and I think one of the main things in GitHub is about pull requests, right? So we start to look at, you know, how many open pull requests are there? Um, uh, are we able to nudge developers to try and close the pull requests faster? Uh, in fact, uh, recently we also did a trial on one of, the pro one of these products called Git Prime. Uh, eventually we didn't go with it, but this Git Prime sort of like looks into even more details, you know, about uh, uh, how people are working uh, using just pure Git data alone. So we do look at some of these numbers, but I must say we are not operating on them, you know, like a end of year KPI or, or things like that. We just use it as more of data to help us in our daily work. Mm. Yes. How do we measure the what? I don't have a base. I mean, I do, the baseline is 100 points, and then uh, based on whatever is showing, it will minus. So I, have, I put a weightage to it. So I might maybe think that uh, having a lot of stories that a PO haven't accept is, you know, disastrous. So I will put a weight, you know, to number of stories times 20. It's very arbitrary. Like I say, it's a very naive algorithm, right? But it just gives me a sense of what is happening. I mean, on, another, on other levels, then we also have CIs, you know, failing build, etc., mm, and stuff like that. Okay, we have one last question behind here. Oh, toughest question. Dentally uh, related to that one. Asking for a friend, uh, <laughs> my CTO wants to use our Agile bot to track work delivered as a measure of performance evaluation. He thinks this is a quantitative way to determine work done. How does this work? <laughs> and will your uh, naive algorithm into a wow. uh, track work done. Uh. Then again, back to Agile, right? What is work done? Work done is working software uh, that provides value to customers. I would rather they look at that you know, rather than looking at work done because they could get a lot of work done. I mean, if they could use this, they could see that there's a lot of commits, there's a lot of stories being built, da, 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 at the end of the day, but it might not translate to users. It might not translate to ROI, right? But maybe if you focus on just one important feature, it could bring you a lot of money already. So, then, no lah. I would definitely discourage that. Like you see all the not not the heads, you know, <laughs> shake head already. So I would say that your friend probably needs to understand more about what agile is about, right? And so that's why I say. Uh, very scary because maybe uh, the person learned about one particular variant of Agile and then started to think that that can be translated to performance numbers and things like that. But it's not. that's not the main point of Agile. It's not to evaluate people. <laughs> it's to get people to work together. Right? So th that's the scary part. Um, and a lot of... Maybe it's, maybe it's part of industry fault as well. Right? Because 
somehow the narrative became that you know agile will make you faster, will make you cheaper, make you better. I don't know why. Right? <laughs> it doesn't work that way. Right? To to add on top of that, um, it, it, it is it, you can you can search up on research on uh, how how uh, extrinsic motivation or extrinsic rewards not motivation sorry extrinsic rewards tends to uh, derail people from doing the tasks uh, uh, more effectively in fact uh, it actually narrows people's uh, vision and and uh, if you are working on a creative uh, work type of work like software development you often have uh, quite a lot of side effects from there so the city your CTO it probably do not may not want that side effects if they, he knows it yeah so, but it's a good question, which is why, um, back to Samantha's question, right? Sometimes i very scared about metrics because if I put it out there, then people will think, okay, I can use that to measure developer, right? Uh, because people have actually came back to me and, and tried to use that. But I would say, that, no, no, we don't use it that way. We don't, you know, look at the metrics and try to say this is what, you know, the developer has done, etc. It might not be correlation. Uh, Yes. Um, capability growth. Uh, but your capability will be about product, about the end. Software engineering, I guess, um, is more of individual and team growth, right? I mean, we, how do we measure that? Uh? Even, but output doesn't mean you are growing, right? You can produce a lot of output. So that's why I, I wouldn't you know, correlate that together. Which is why it's scary, because sometimes when you put out matrix, then people will hold you to that, and people will say that, oh, this is how the team is doing. So when we talk about velocity, then people will say, oh, how come the team is 40 points velocity, this is only 20 points. But then we need to explain, actually you cannot do that. You cannot, you cannot compare. Uh, some people have tried to come back to me, to like, oh, now so no, I can compare, right? How come this team is slower, this team is faster? No, I say, this doesn't work that way. Every team got different people, Right, uh, and different products that they're working on. Some are more difficult, some are easier. I'm not using the bots to compare, right? But when people come from a very traditional view, they'll be like, no, no, no. At some point in time, people will compare, and I'm like, no, this is not exact. This is really not what I'm doing and what this is all about. Yeah, mm. it's for self evaluation. I hear from you, right? I think uh, your 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 belief of agile is more on agile mindset, yeah. kind of kind of changing, yes. changing people. Yeah. But I think the challenging part, I think what what they have been uh, trying to understand is more about how, even as of today, you you are sitting here, how you how you measure your success. So so I think I think we can look at uh, yeah. I mean the culture oh. looks very good, but but how you yourself measure the success in a way because it's very intangible. Yes. I think that, that is a problem I face also because I know that agile is about mindset. It's very intangible. Yeah. But how, how do we how do we look at it as a success success uh, factor or even talk about metrics? Mm. Is, is there anything that you can share? Uh, one, one gauge I would use to see whether it's success or not is when I start to see developers talking and trying to own it right, and not just be at the receiving end of ah, you just tell me what to do, then I'll build whatever you want, right? Because when they start to have their maturity, like you know, they can be part of the process, they can own the process, they can have a say in it. Then I feel they will start to be engaged and they will start to make sure you know this team works in a very collaborative manner. What I've seen like with low agile maturity is that developers then will always be taking the back seat to be like, yeah, you need to give me in you know exact specifications. Then I will just build according to that. Then, then that is low agile maturity to me. I feel high ma agile maturity is they are getting involved as well to help to co-create that specification. Uh, that is one I, I would say. I mean another another thing is you know how people start to use all of these practices, uh, and uh, iterate with them, iterate these practices within their team or even in their personal lives, right? Like, uh. When we started doing this, we started to do retrospectives, you know, with teams. And then, um, so this is a story, right? So I have people uh, playing Fortnite. There's this game called Fortnite, right? Do you all play games? Yeah. 
<laughs> so then they started uh, do they, they did a retrospective, you know, on how they can better play that game. <laughs> I don't know whether the paper is still somewhere, right? So they, they did a retrospective on that. Then that to me is I feel, yeah, they are trying to apply some of these concepts into their daily life as well, which means they find something valuable out of it. Yeah, so I know, I agree, it's intangible. At the end of the day, luckily, or fortunately, my boss is not measuring me on certain metrics uh, because otherwise it's a bit hard. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, it is a bit, because I, I don't know yeah, but I guess ultimately what this would translate into would hopefully be uh, better products, you know, um, faster. Very hard to quantify whether it's faster or not, but uh, at least you would feel that. Um, I think you could, you would be able to feel it, uh, You know, the 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 drag or how how the team is moving, uh, etc. Maybe others with, uh, yeah, with experience can. Well, uh, I think we, we are going to get get to a closure. <laughs> we could probably still spend another hour here, but pro probably uh, uh, let, let's get some closure. And before we leave, um, what what would be the parting words for people who are beginning or are on their agile journey for them? What would be your parting words to them? Uh, don't give up. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I think it's not easy, yeah, right? Uh, especially with changing mindsets. Um, it's going to be very tough, uh, very tiring at times. Uh, but if you believe in it, then don't give up. Uh, and hopefully, you know, you'll see the light at the end of the tunnel. Uh, I mean, um, you might not be able to change everyone's perception. Uh, but I feel that even if you have one, if you have, if you have impact, you know, on one person, uh, I think that's a start. That's good enough. The one person would help you spread, you know, the knowledge. One of the reasons why I joined SP Digital and why we did this as well, at least in my belief, is that we are going to work with the people here and hopefully impart whatever we know to the people here. At the end of the day, you know, people would leave the organization, but hopefully they would have you know, learn something from this experience. And this will be the little seed within the industry, you know, that will help grow the plant that we'll see in 10 years' time. People working with me, um, one, of the, one day they will become a leader, right, in one organization. And hopefully, something that they learn about here would help them uh, do the right thing in the future. That's my belief, lah. So much for your generosity, your thank you, and showing us your determination in uh, creating a productive environment for developers and for other people in the product development. Let's give a round of applause for Winston. Thank you, thank you. So I believe we will still be hanging around for uh, yes. about 10, 10, 20 minutes. Um, feel free to to chat with with us. Yeah. Thank you, thank you.